so my my intention here today is that you'll get exactly what you paid for so uh, <laughs> I know you didn't pay to get in here so uh, expectations are you know but <clears throat> this is not something that I can say I've been doing for years uh, this is something that I've been studying for the last three years I have done it on a limited scale uh, enough to know that I believe it works I believe it can do what they say it can do and I know I haven't gone into great detail as to what they say it can do and I'm not going to because there's a lot more than than what we really need to cover here today today I'm going to talk about what we need to do in May in Manitoba and what do we need to do we need to keep our bees from swarming so that means we need to split well there's something here that I put in my notes called the Manitoba problem so what's the Manitoba problem? Your bees build up in the spring. You need to split them mid to late May. Where are you going to get your queens? You're going to buy them from some far off land. That's pretty much your only real viable option. Manitoba queens can start to come out. What's the earliest, John, that you can think that you could reliably get a Manitoba queen? I mean, if you had a textbook picture Remember that the queen has to, your existing queen has to start raising drones, and then I think it's 42 days after that before you reach suction. Yep, yep. So in the end, you're looking at well, end of May, and that's that's absolute best case scenario. Best case, and, and that happens once every five, six, yeah. seven years. Yeah. So if you want to depend on your bees are going to swarm anyway, regardless, right? Your bees are going to build up. I talked to somebody the other day. Uh, I said it's kind of like kind of like baking bread. I don't know if you ever baked bread or seen somebody bake bread. You know, you mix up the bread dough, you put it in the in the in the big bowl, and you cover it, and let it sit in a warm place, and it gets all big and rised up. Then what do they do? They do something that look just just horrifies you. You think, wow, that's nice, fluffy, big bread. Let's bake that. No, they go to the bowl and they mash it all down into the bottom. Well, it's because it's too big. And then it'll rise again into a state where you can bake it and get some proper bread. It's kind of, in my impression, what you need to do with your bees. They come out of spring, and this spring is a terrible spring, so I don't know if we're going to have less swarming this year. I'm not going to have any swarming here. My bees are terrible. I, I had a really bad winter. Uh, but you need to take those bees, take those colonies, kind of give them a little bit of a squeeze so that they don't just totally overwhelm themselves and start dividing and, and swarming. Dividing is a reproduction impulse. And you know that among every species on the planet, there is nothing stronger that drives a, a, a being than a reproduction impulse. And that's what drives the bees to swarm. So... <clears throat> If you don't want to buy your queens from some far off land, well, why wouldn't you? Cost, maybe. I know I was buying Manitoba queens for $30. I think uh, queens from elsewhere go up from there. I've bought California queens from Be Made in past years and paid $45 for that queen. That's a bit much to me, uh, especially if I'm trying to queen 100 colonies. And if you're a really big beekeeper, which I'm, well, I'm a big beekeeper, I just don't have very many bees. If you have lots of bees, then, I mean, that's just going to compound. You, you're talking, you know, tens of thousands of dollars for queens. I'm not suggesting what I'm going to go into here is, is an answer to a thousand or ten thousand colony operation. I'm not ruling it out because nobody's ever proven that it isn't. Um, I think this is a, a very good option for sideliner and hobbyist beekeepers. And I had a guy phone me, was it yesterday? And actually phoned me Thursday. And uh, he wanted to tell me all about how he raises queens and that was good. I thanked him for explaining that to me. Um, but at one time in the conversation, he says, what do you have against grafting? 
And I said, well, I don't have anything against grafting. Why, what would make you think of that? It seems in, in, in the queen rearing information that I've studied, grafting is the default. Grafting seems to be the thing that, if you want to raise queens, you better start to learn, learn how to graft. It's a good way to raise queens. I won't argue with that. But I will argue that it's, not, that it's the only way. It's not the only way. And to me, why don't I want to graft? I don't need to make 100 queens at a time. I don't even need, need to make 50 at a time. Um, cell builders for grafting are very, very powerful hives. And to me, those take a lot of resources. Those take a lot of borrowed brood and a lot of borrowed nurse bees from other colonies. And guess what happens this time of year when you start borrowing resources from other hives? What happens to those hives? Maybe you only have two hives. Can you make a hive that's strong enough to graft num you know, many, many queens? You don't need many, many queens. Maybe you need two, maybe you need one. So this is an option for using the resource you have it's called on the spot and that's the kind of the whole gist of it is you do it on the spot you you approach your hive what you need is there and that hive will make the queens you need now there are other aspects of it later on i'll be doing another uh, round of this late june and you're you're welcome to uh, come and and take part if you want uh, for for other reasons today like for, for build-up reasons and for wintering queens reasons. Today we're going to deal with, with swarm mitigation uh, and splitting our hives. So what we do need, and th I'm getting ahead of myself here, but we just need a hive and we need a nuke box is all we need right now to do this. So we don't need a lot of resources. We don't need a lot of equipment. We don't need a lot of specialized things. Is everybody familiar with grafting? What people do, what people <laughs> go through when they graft? If you're not, I'll give a quick little rundown. Okay, so everybody kind of knows that process. How many people think it's intimidating? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. How many people think they can't see larvae that are that small? <laughs> can't handle a, can't, maybe can't handle a grafting tool without flipping the thing over and, and drowning it in royal jelly. Uh, I don't mean to, to poo-poo grafting, it's, a, it's an excellent way to do things. It has its challenges, is all I'm saying, and there are options to maybe get around some of these challenges. This is one option to get around, and this is not what I'm going to talk about today, but this is one option so you don't have to graft. Uh, Genter makes one of these, this is a Nikot or Nico, some say. There's more to it than just this, but to summarize, you simply sequester your queen in the little device. The device is filled with cups that a grafter would graft into. However, they're here, so the queen is going to lay right into the cups. You let the queen lay, you take those cups. From that point on, it's grafting. Put those in your grafting frame, put it in your cell builder, and on and on. So that's one option if you want to do the grafting style. Um, I did a queen rearing course last June. The teacher is a very good teacher and a very successful queen bre uh, breeder. Queen rearer, I think is the, the, the term, there's a little bit of a difference. And he said this is a very good option. And there was one reason he didn't use it. He has used it and there's one reason he didn't use it is that he needs to come back multiple times to that hive to check to see if the queen had laid in the cups. Whereas grafting, he pulls his brood frame uh, to graft, and that's the only time he visits the hive. And that's a very good point. So this would take a few more visits back to the hive. If you're only doing a few queens or doing it in your yard, that might not be a problem. Thanks, Jay. That might be a good trade-off for not having to pick up those little larva with that tiny spoon and put them in a cup. <clears throat> so my first part here 
and these are mostly notes for me so I don't miss things, get too far off track, is, uh, is there anybody here who doesn't have the basics of how a queen is made? How a queen is turned into a queen? Queens, <laughs> and I know not everybody does want to speak up if they don't know, but please do if you don't know. Queen eggs and worker eggs are identical. There is no difference in the, in the product. Maybe where they are is different, but when they're laid, they're the same. That, <clears throat> that larva, once it hatches, is changed, DNA is changed by the feed that it's fed. Uh, royal jelly, I'm going to differentiate in two terms, royal jelly and worker jelly. Because royal jelly, we always talk about workers being fed royal jelly, that's not incorrect. However, today I'm going to call that worker jelly. Uh, worker jelly and royal jelly are different composition. And I have a, a link there on your paper, you can look that up later. It's a very detailed scientific document, but if you look at it, you can see that it's different. It's a different, uh, I think the largest difference in it is a protein, it's higher protein. And so when that larva, when that egg hatches and that larva appears, the bees start to feed it. And the bee will feed that larva a different jelly than it would feed a worker larva. And that starts the change in DNA into a queen. So that's pretty much it, how a queen is made. You can see by the, the first part, the little chart here, that, that a worker uh, a worker is capped on, on uh, day 9 and emerges day 21. A queen is capped on day 9 and emerges on, on day 16. To me, I think that's, that's counterintuitive, isn't it? Because you, you always think of a queen as, as being so much more substantial there's more complex and the you know it's a, a bigger deal it's a bigger bee yet you know she emerges close to a week early right so that's just how you know how masterfully these insects are made so drones we look at those two uh, just because uh, just because they are as important a part to raising queens as workers and queens themselves. They play an extremely uh, important part. So they're capped, they're capped day 11 and emerge day 24, but they can't mate successfully for another 10 days. So you look at well over a month between uh, a drone egg being laid and a drone being able to mate with your queen. And that timing was summed up to me by Waldemar. And he just basically said, if you don't see drones walking on the comb, it's not time to graft. You wait to graft until you see drones on the comb. So I think that's a good rule. You don't have to necessarily constantly work out the math. Uh, you just have to watch for drones. You can see the drone cells easily long before that but that's time to start making your plans you can start to do the math and say when are these boys going to emerge uh, and then start making your plans but unless you see a drone walking around it's too early I fear today is too early but I wanted to do this and I wanted to share this and we planned this so I'm pushing my season a little bit I don't think I have a lot of drones yet but I'll run that risk. So of course nurse bees, I note at the bottom here, nurse bees also responsible for keeping brood warm. Uh, well feeding brood of course, I didn't specify that, uh, but keeping brood warm and that's going to come into play when we make up our nukes. That's just going to be one of the resources we need to make sure the nukes have. They have enough bees. You don't need too many bees, you need enough bees. And enough bees is kind of regulated by how much brood do you have. So, we kind of know how, how they go out and make a queen. Well, why would they? 
And essentially there are three reasons they would make a queen. Uh, emergency, the queen is gone. One day they realize, one minute they realize, we have no queen. We need to make a new plan. So they need to jump on that. So in that case, they'll choose a larva that was laid two days, three days ago, and they'll pull that out, feed it as, start feeding it royal jelly. They may have fed that worker jelly for a time. They start feeding that royal jelly and pull that out uh, of the comb into a peanut and raise a queen off of that. It's, it's almost universally accepted that an emergency queen is the worst queen you're going to get of the three. So that's not exactly what we want to happen. People talk about walkaway splits. Some people swear by them. I like the idea. I'm kind of lazy and it's really easy to do walkaway splits, right? Does anybody not know what, what walkaway split is? Hands? Everybody knows what walkaway? Okay. So we'll take, uh, you essentially want a double brood chamber uh, to do a walkaway. I would look through it, make sure I have appropriately aged larva in both bottom and top boxes, meaning I have eggs, I have newly hatched larva in bottom and top boxes. The ease of walkaway split is no finding the queen. I love it when I don't have to find the queen because I suck at finding the queen. So a walk away, you take one box and you put it on a new bottom board and either that box or the original box is now queenless. You don't know where the queen is, but she's in one of them and the other one has no queen. So the one that has no queen now goes into emergency mode and says, we need a queen, let's make one. So they go ahead and make an emergency queen. Again, I've talked to people who swear by them. I've been doing them for decades and they work great. I'm glad of that, <laughs> that it does work great. In theory to me, because I'm a new beekeeper, I can't say I've been doing walkaways for 10 years and they've always worked great. It seems to me I want to up my chances a little bit. So that's a walk away. Supersedure is another reason the bees might make a queen. Uh, Supersedure is we're going to replace her. The, it's, it's kind of a, uh, it's, it's known that the old bees in the hive run the hive. The queen doesn't run the hive. The queen is just a tool. The queen is just a servant. The queen is the biggest servant in the place. The old bees run the hive. So the old bees will decide, Queenie's not cutting it anymore. Maybe she lost a wing, maybe she lost a leg, maybe she's slowing down, maybe she's not laying properly or not laying enough, okay? So we're gonna off the old girl and we're gonna get somebody younger in here. And we're gonna, we're gonna even make the younger one do the offing. <laughs> so they'll go and take, uh, uh, a, a larva, an egg or a larva that's been laid and they'll feed that royal jelly, pull it out into a peanut and make a queen. Uh, John, did, will they use a cup in that that case or will they just use a, a regular uh, worker cell uh, as a rule? Uh, it depends on the urgency. I mean if it's a procedure uh, or it's an emergency uh, I've seen them just choose the oddest place and just build out from there. And yeah. Very yeah. And yeah. I think it's, that's somewhat depending on the situation. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. I, I don't think they'll they'll usually use a queen cup, and I think most people have seen a queen cup. Uh, it, it's just that it's, it looks like a little cup and it's hanging down. Not a cell. It's not built up. It's just a little cup. But. I think that can be a good queen because they've decided uh, kind of early on in that larva's life we're going to choose just the right one, we're going to make a queen. It's kind of, to me, it's the, it's the second worst or the second best of the three. <laughs> to me, the best queen is a swarm queen because as far as quality of queen, 
because that that egg was laid as a queen egg now it's not any different than a worker egg but the purpose for that egg when it was laid was to be a queen that's what's laid in that cup when you see that cup in your hive that's some people call it a swarm cup so the the instant that egg hatches into a larva it gets royal jelly it never gets worker jelly so to me that's the best queen the hive has a queen so they're not uh, they're not in emergency mode they're not disadvantaged in any way they want to swarm because they're overwhelmed usually because there's too many bees for the box so we have lots and lots of bees to feed that queen there's lots of bees to keep it warm uh, usually it's a nice time of year so we're going to swarm when there's dr lots of drones out so all of these reasons to me swarm queen is is the queen I want I've done quite a few colonies here with swarm queens if I if I find a swarm cell in a colony I'll make a nuke out of that set it aside I have my nuke stand over here I'll line up 15 or 20 nukes on there and they'll just sit for a time then I'll check to see if we have eggs and most of the time we have a mated queen we have eggs that turns into a production colony and makes honey that summer so that I think I mean the first time I did that well, I did that the, the bees did the hard stuff right <laughs> the first time that happened <laughs> um, I just did a happy dance right that was just the, the most amazing thing to see as a new beekeeper that, that it was really that easy so kind of where I'm going with that is the intimidation of raising queens doesn't have to be there the bees do the hard work and the bees want to make queens so all you need to do is is give them what what they what they want anyway I use the analogy one day it has cat any cat people here people have cats yeah I got cats anybody try to train a cat <laughs> dog people you train your dog right cat people train your cat nobody right I see no hands well I know how you train a cat I figured it out I'm over 50 years old and find I have cats all my whole life I figured out how you train a cat you study the cat long enough and tell you can predict what it's going to do and then you tell it to do it just before it does it that's how you train a cat right oh jump up on the chair jump oh good boy you know so that's what you're doing bees don't fight your bees work with them guide them steer them train your bees like you train a cat watch them say ah you want you guys want to do this okay let's do that get with the program let's do that let's make queens it's spring we want to swarm we've got all this energy we've got this big freight train going the, down the track that'll speak to Jay uh, let's not slow down the freight train let's not turn it let's just get on board and say let's make some queens let's let's prepare for this let's divide let's multiply this hive all you need is the boxes and things to do it and the timing and the timing comes from them not from you and that's where I have an advantage this is my full-time job uh, hobbyist you have a tough time because you got that full-time job maybe your evening and weekend beekeeper every time you have a minute away from work you can do that split it's raining or it's cold or it's dark so it's a big challenge okay that's another advantage I think to OTS because it's it's a very condensed operation on how to make that happen that you can do that you can go to your bee yard you can do your OTS and you can leave and you'll see it doesn't take long I'm almost embarrassed to haul you out here to show you because there's nothing to it and that's why I'm talking so much I have to use up time right if I were to just show you how to do it you'd be at home by now so I've gone over the Manitoba problem um, some people say and I don't know this firsthand but some people say you know the big queen queen breeders in in California the gene pool is getting kind of small and you know all the problems that are associated with that again I don't know that firsthand but I've, I've heard people contest that 
uh, again people say local genes are best uh, I had a really tough winter here I put 109 colonies into winter and I've chosen 14 that I think are good enough to raise a queen and it almost brings a tear to my eye to say that that's 109 I had in winter and this is what I've got left talked to a friend the other day though she made me feel really good she said okay let's turn this around she said you make sure that you get all the queens off of those hives that you can because they just survived the worst winter ever in beekeeping and the numbers are coming in across Canada now and some provinces are saying worst winter in 20 years some are saying worst winter ever and so I have 14 colonies here that are good colonies maybe some of them aren't what I would call boomers or strong colonies but they're good colonies and there's 14 of them and they survive the worst winter on record so I have total gold stars here for those 14 so we're starting again and we're using OTS to look forward to that build up again so local genes those queens who can make it there's a lot more to make in a winter than just the genetics in your queen but very very important component so I wrote a little bit about grafting here and again I'm not knocking grafting it's intimidating to me and, and I think a lot of other people. Um, but I just wanted to contrast why kind of I've gravitated toward the OTS model. If you want to graft, uh, buy or build a grafting frame that's capable of holding dozens of queen cells, complete with cups, mounts, cups, hair roller, queen cages, etc. Some people get into incubators and, and, and on and on. Buy a grafting tool buy a magnifier and a bright LED light make sure you have a warm place away from the bees to do your grafting uh, be sure to keep the frame of larva warm and covered with a moist cloth otherwise the larva will die uh, make up a queenless cell builder by shaking nurse bees from two or three additional colonies into your cell builder until not one more bee can fit have, have you ever seen a video of Michael Palmer making a, a cell builder <laughs> if you haven't you should it's unbelievable it's unbelievable. A strong hive may have 80,000 bees. I'm sure he has a half a million bees in a, in a cell builder. I might be exaggerating a little bit. It's impressive, isn't it, John? <laughs> to the point where you're thinking that this can't be right, this is probably damaging, but... Yeah, it's, it's just results? absolutely stuff. He, he gets results. Um, to some of you, this might look like a kind of a small bee yard. To some of you, it might look like a, a fairly good size. But... If I had a bee yard with four colonies and I want to make queens and the person who's advising me says well you need to graft and if, and if you need to graft you're going to need to make a cell builder so you're going to need to shake all the nurse bees from three hives into a fourth hive uh, right away I'm thinking say what I only have four hives <laughs> so so I want to shake all of my nurse bees out of three hives and, and what happens to those three that can't be good so right away the door closes and I think I don't know that doesn't sound like it's for me be sure your cell builder has a complete frame of pollen and plenty of honey stores we need to do that too but our cell builder is building a few Queens so that making sure we have enough of that resource is far easier for us and it's usually there anyway this time of year have you looked at the pollen stores in your hive lots of pollen no problem you don't even have to think about that just eyeball it make sure it's there and you're good you can spend your morning grafting larva that you can't see that I think is the funniest thing just they always tell you you'll know the larva is, is young enough if you can't see it place your graft in the cell builder and wait to see if you did it right you know you wait a few days you go pull the frame and none of them are built out okay let's start again you know uh, and the clock is ticking right now you're getting closer to your swarm season now your your summer is waning on you don't have much time in Manitoba to make Queens so just some of the reasons that the OTS kind of speaks to me and again not that grafting is bad
if you read Mel Disselcone's book, which I'm sure none of you have, um, but if you read that book, you would read him going on and on about old, old beekeepers doing a lot uh, of procedures that are a lot like this. And there were books written, I actually had a cursory look at one last night, from 1883, a beekeeper was describing uh, raising queens in a very similar way to what we're doing here. Um, and what they were doing back then is they would essentially cut the comb. They would either cut it in a V shape or in a, in a kind of an arc or a dish shape. And they would notice that uh, the bees would pull queens off of that. But they didn't really take their understanding to the next level. Um, and this, this I'm taking from Mel's book because he's done all the research on this. Uh, they didn't take that to the next level to understand really why the queens are doing that. And this is where Mel stumbled across this whole thing. He worked on this for many, many years and he realized why the bees do that. Not just that they do, but why. So he took the why and he simplified the process even further. The essence of what Mel discovered was we know that worker cells are built in the comb like this. The cells are tipped up a little, but basically they're horizontal cells. The egg is laid horizontally, it hatches. We always look at them flat, so we say the egg stands up, but doesn't it? It's like this. Drone cells, same thing, right? But we also know that queen cells are different, aren't they? Queen cells are like that. And Mel discovered that the workers, we know, we've talked about the fact that the workers are the ones who make a queen. They're the ones who decide that that's a queen larva, I'm going to feed it as a queen, therefore it's going to turn into a queen. He discovered that their cue to feed that queen at the beginning was that that cell has no floor. Not that it's a vertical cell, but the cell has no bottom. So he discovered that all he does is he takes his hive tool and he cuts the bottom out of that cell under that larva. He pulls that comb down a little so they have room to draw out a cell and they do. They see that larva, this cell has no floor, this has got to be a queen. I'm going to feed it as such and it works. We have other two other things we're going to do to kind of entice them. To, uh, or two things we're going to take advantage of to entice them to make queens, to get them in the mood to make queens. But I've actually done that in a queen right colony. I've done that in a third box above a double. I've done that notching and they've made a queen for me in a queen right hive. So they have no, they have no real incentive to make a queen, but they saw that cell had no floor and they made a queen. I did two notches, one of them they fixed and they just made workers. So the fact that I only did part of the process gave me less than perfect results. But it showed me that that works, that that's enough incentive to make the bees feed that as a queen and make a queen. So the two other things that we're going to use to entice them to make a queen is two of those natural responses that I talked about a minute ago is we're going to do it this time of year when they're getting so strong and so itchy to swarm that they really need to start making queens and they really really want to make queens and we're going to add a component to that we're going to add an emergency response which is queenlessness so unfortunately the very first thing you need to do in OTS is find the queen but that's the very hardest part of the whole thing, uh, fortunately. If we keep records, I'm really terrible at keeping records, I'll, I'll say that right up front. But if we keep records, and the one record I have here right now, well, I have two records. I have some of my queens are marked, and I know where I bought those queens. And also we have some colonies, they're actually doing pretty good right now. Look at this blue one. This is one I chose for notching. So, so that's an indication to me of where I want to go. That's half of the equation. Because the other half is a little harder to control. 
The other half is the boys. So where are the boys going to come from? Quite likely my neighbor. I had a student yesterday came here and she said I have one hive and I don't see any drones. So okay, um, even if you only have one hive, is your sister queen going to mate with brother drone? Even if they will, it's not going to work out very well likely. You can have a poorly mated queen. But it's your neighbors. I asked her, where are you? She told me and I said, you, I, know, I know beekeepers around you. So you don't have a problem. Um, we're looking about five miles, John, to, to look for a beekeeper, I think. If you have somebody in five miles, don't worry about that. But it's not something you can control. If you really get into this, then you start choosing drone mothers, right? Choose some of your queen mothers, choose some of your drone mothers. Drone mothers should be in a different yard, maybe a couple miles away. And so drone mothers maybe should be a couple of miles away. Uh, if you really want to study things, find out where your DCAs are likely to be. I'm not that keen. I'd rather leave that up to the bees. I think they can figure that out. But that's all of the things. Just finding a, a queen who overwintered is, is a small part of the equation. But it's an important part of the equation. And it's a part of the equation I can track and I can control. I have enough drones here that I should be okay too. Nature takes care of my drone selection. Because if you look in your hive, when I became a beekeeper, one of the things that, that spoke to me when I would look in my hive is drone cells. If I could see a hive with drone cells, to me that told a story that this hive is feeling good. They're doing well. Drones take a lot of resources. So if a, if a hive is struggling to build up, struggling to survive, they're not going to waste resources on drones, which is a good thing. Because if they're struggling because of a deficiency in the queen or even disease, uh, nature takes care of that for me. No drones. Great. They don't get to get into my gene pool. So it's the strong hives that are making the drones and it's the strong hives that are mating with my queens that I'm taking from the strong hives. Some things that I can control, some things that I can see are being controlled and I can control. I try not to lose any sleep over me not controlling everything. But uh, as far as genetic diversity, that's, that's a fantastic point. If you have one or two hives and you use this or any other method to make your queens this year, next year, you do that again the next year, and you do that again the next year, your lineage is pretty vertical. You have some drones coming in, but your queen lineage is vertical. That's not a good thing. So bringing in a queen from somewhere, bringing in a cell from somewhere, cells are cheap. You go to a beekeeper who's got some cells, you can get them for five bucks, put them in a nuke, mate them, now you have some diversity and you can make you can if she's a good queen make some queens off of that just mix things up a bit even if you're not if you're if you're like me and you're not the greatest record keeper and tracking absolutely every nuance of this queen keep throwing some new genetics in there if you have a few more hives your genetics are probably going to be a little more diverse for a longer time but should still be putting in more genetics. Last year, 2015, I bought four nukes from a guy here in Manitoba, and he's a queen breeder too. And uh, there's still some of those queens out here. They're good queens. So if you need recommendations, you know, there are a lot of queen breeders like that who have good queens, uh, but he's one of them. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of thing. Talk to your fellow beekeepers, find somebody who's got an experience, or at least somebody who's making their living. You know, if you start to not pay the bills, that means maybe you have a, not a very good product. Uh, this last picture, I'll explain that a little bit, what, what Mel was doing in this picture. He found a 257 caliber bullet fit in that cell real nice, that, that worker cell. Experimented with ball bearings, he experimented with all kinds of other stuff. 
but the point isn't what, what to put in there, the point is why. And what he was doing was to make his cell builder so much stronger and to make his cell builder so much more eager to jump on his queens, he wanted to eliminate all the rest of the brood in the hive. Not unlike Michael Palmer's method. Make sure there's no brood to feed, then they're only going to feed my queens. So he would put, he would select his larva, put something in the cell to protect it, and then dust the frame with flour, and that would smother and kill all the larva, the open larva, on that frame. Then he would notch that and put that in his cell builder, and uh, that just multiplies the, the effect of his nurse bees on his queens, because there's only six or eight larva now with an entire hive to feed. So they would make really nice queens that way. But I don't think that's really necessary uh, and it really, you know, <laughs> pushes that hive back a long ways by killing all those uh, potential uh, worker bees. So we looked a little bit about grafting, what we need for grafting, and I think grafting has been sort of reviewed and explained to most of you in the past. So what do we need uh, to raise queens. You need bees. Simple as that. You need bees. Uh, you need a nuke box or two and that's about it. And a hive tool. I think you'll have a hive tool. So what do the bees need? They need young larvae. They need pollen, honey, nurse bees, uh, drones to mate with later on when she uh, emerges, and a reason. And we're going to give them two. So we should, we're going to give them two reasons and a few opportunities and uh, we should be successful with, with raising these queens. So we're going to look for the small larva, 36 hour old brood. Uh, we'll be providing the bees with resources they need, ensuring the colony has sufficient nurse bees, giving the bees those two reasons. And we talked about waiting until we have drones to mate. A little paragraph I wrote on how do you find larva that's too small to see. That's an interesting conundrum. We need to work with things we can't see. Well, I can't see. It's hard to see with a naked eye. You can use magnifiers. They work great. But there's a couple of little indications that I use to find those. And one is it, there's a pattern and you can see the laying pattern your queen. This time of year, I don't know about your hives, but do your laying patterns look kind of goofy, kind of all over the place? My patterns don't really look very good. And I chalk that up to just, you know, starting out in the spring and she's laying wherever she can. She doesn't maybe have the perfect frame to lay in. Uh, so the pattern maybe is a little off on, on many of my frames, but generally you'll find your cap brood in the center and as you radiate out from that, you'll get into the old open brood, younger open brood, and then eggs on the outside. So that'll give you an idea of where that transition is between brood and eggs, and that's the line you want to look for. And also, what I can see in the bottom of a cell, before I can see uh, a newly hatched larva, I can see a dot of raw jelly. It'll be worker jelly, right? In the bottom of that cell. So I'll see something glisten. I like to use black foundation, it makes my life way easier for doing this kind of thing. Um, my vision isn't as good as some people. And the black foundation allows me to see eggs and the little dots of raw jelly, worker jelly, uh, much easier. After you, after you have notched and you put it in there and after the appropriate time when you go check and stuff like that, I've been trying to read up on what do it and a lot of people seem to skip over this part. What do you do if it's not successful? Like. Like, I, I know it's online there, on a lot of Facebook guys are talking about it right now, and guys are like, oh no, maybe there's workers laying in there or something like that. Yeah. And you gotta watch out for that. Like, can you just throw it back in? I mean, you don't want to throw it back in if you have Well, it's no good throwing it back in because the larva is too old. Yeah. At that point. Um, actually, I'll talk about the calendar a little bit too, but yeah, I mean, at that point, you've taken the queen out, she hasn't laid in whatever length of time. Yeah. Maybe you notched and three days later you come and, and check. Uh, we know by our, our, our timeline here that... that uh, what was it? Guys are saying, I guess after, have to look it up. Even if the queen's like 
circle and she I, that's I think that's maybe what I was thinking was like you've got the queen cells you've taken them out you put them in the new box you put it off to the side the queen comes out flies never returns yeah what do you do with that nuke well you've got something in that nuke and that's why it's kind of a kind of a, a window there of you don't want to disturb that nuke while yeah, while she's emerging and mating you don't you don't want a couple of weeks eh? 10 days minimum a couple of weeks if she doesn't mate and you don't check that for three weeks now your workers are going to start to lay or you're in danger of that so yeah. you have a window there okay so that's just what you're going to look at uh, i try to leave it two weeks yeah that's from when i put that weeks. cell in there yeah, yeah, yeah. and then two weeks i'll look in there if i don't see eggs then i'll just use those resources up wherever i can just there's it's, go notch it's, another one. it's been queenless long enough there's no more brood in there right yeah. so i have no brood to use i can shake those bees in front of a hive i can shake them into a hive there's not very many bees in there anyway yeah. so it's just a box of resources there's okay. no brood so that, that that's the whole point of just trying to make sure that you don't end up with lame workers is that two week window kind of deal you want to make sure you get in there if yeah you know. don't leave it a month no <laughs> you know because then you've got the whole other issue to deal with potentially i just noticed this question is popping up on facebook yeah. on the ots facebook page there a lot it's like oh uh you know obviously it didn't work what do i do with my bees and everyone's kind of skipping over it and i don't i didn't get a clear answer on that yeah. page on that and that's all i wanted to yeah yeah on. well and like record keeping i'm with brad i'm pathetic yeah honestly <laughs> you know if only we had these little magic boxes that could track everything but <laughs> yeah you know, i'm really lax at it but what i'll do especially if i'm trying to track hatching dates painter tape yeah just on the edge of your new box or the edge of your hive in that way especially if my son is falling behind me or i have to send someone else out then there's, there's sort of a clear record but sort of i didn't have a good way of marking my hives i came out here a week ago or so to check all of my hives so i could choose which ones we could use for the workshop and I did. I started choosing them and finding the ones I wanted to use. And I and I thought, well, I didn't plan on a way to mark these. How am I going to mark? So I went over and I got some. I got some little sticks that I was using for shims earlier on in the spring. And I thought, well, I'll just set a stick on the top of each hive that I'm going to use. And then the big wind came up, and most of my sticks are on the ground. <laughs> so <laughs> I uh, I kind of know the. I put the pallets up that we're going to use, so it'll be one of the two. And we should be able to tell pretty easily which ones to use. So you can see how many, uh, you know, how many are not very good. There's a lot on the ground and they're not good. A lot of them aren't going to make it. I'm going to have to, after this, I'm going to have to take those and, and start combining. And hopefully I can find one, maybe one out of four I can make that's going to actually perform. That's the tough decision. There's going to be a lot of queens pinched here pretty soon. It's just what you got to do, right? So this little calendar at the end, this is a great tool. You can see the the uh, link here at the top, the beeyard.org. Um, and you have to look through the menus to find the, the calendar, but it's not hard to find. They've actually made this really nifty tool. You can enter your date that you want to graft, and then it'll customize this calendar for you, tell you what to do on what day and what date. So I kind of like to go through this with tongue in cheek uh, because I've made up this calendar. Your calendar starts on the 19th, which is this one. So when we choose our larva here in the hive, I think we're going to use this blue one to start with. Uh, this is going to be day four. So we can look back on Wednesday that egg was laid. And then if you're this, this is made up for grafting. So this is why I kind of like to look at this. On Friday, if you're grafting, then on Friday, you go and select and create your queenless cell builder and build that up with all the nurse bees and resources that you need to do the job. If you're doing OTS, you sit on the couch and watch TV. So again, easy, right? So day four, Saturday, we're, we're going to graft, which I'll show you how easy that is in OTS. Six, check your grafts. So day nine, so next Thursday, our grafted cells, our queen cells here, are going to be capped. 
Saturday and Sunday. This is a very important piece about queens. If you see a queen cell you want to use, treat it very, very kindly. Don't shake it. I have just the worst habit of pull a frame, shake the bees off, and then discover it's got a cell on it. Well, guess what I've done? I've probably just killed that queen. So if you know there's a cell on that frame you want to use, brush. Brush bees, don't shake. Well, Saturday we're going to be doing uh, the day 13, and this is, this is next week. So that's, that's the timing with OTS, is it's, it's a seven day. We're going to start today, we're going to do part two and make our nukes next Saturday. Um, and it, it's a, I think it's the perfect timing system for a, for a hobbyist that has a job, right? You want to do this on Saturday. And so Saturday or Sunday, you could probably stretch that to Sunday if you need to. Uh, so you can just time that seven days apart. It should work for you. So, should we begin? I'll just show you this so then we can set it aside. This is, uh, I just did this example yesterday when it was raining. This is what we're gonna do. This is a notch. And all I did was take my hive tool, I cut down the bottom of the cell. Try not to touch the larva. Don't drag the larva out of there get all the way to the foundation and then pull it down and give them some space to uh, draw that cell. So you can pass that around if you want. This box has a divider. That's why it has entrance on each corner and then a small cover over each nuke. This nuke didn't make it so there's nothing in there Just to speak of. Just a note on these, these here. Yeah. I guess frame positioning is really important that you're not... Oh yeah, so you were thinking more of a follower board. Yeah. 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 I actually glued these in, um, you don't always have to, but I decided I want to make these a full time, I call it a double nuke. Yeah. Um, that'll take five frames on each side still, that divider is nice and narrow. So, we're going to find the queen. Who's the best at finding the queen? Anybody really good at it? Apparently he is. He is. <laughs> You're good at it? Yep. Hit and miss. I was inspecting for a guy one time. I was kneeling down beside the hive, looking through. It was a single on the ground, you know, and I'm looking through frames. He's standing up, not even as close as John is to this hive, watching me. And he says, well, there's the queen. And I looked up and I thought, I, I, I thought to myself, well, you're full of crap. And then I looked down at the frame and there was the queen. So I said, man, you're good at that, aren't you? So he was pretty proud. You get better as time goes on. Yeah, you do. Yeah. It's kind of, at this point, to me, it's, it's looking for something different. You've got all of these worker bees. Especially if you don't have very many drones, it's a little easier. Drones are different, right? So all these worker bees you just sort of sort of tune them out and then you can see I, the I sesame they, street they, walk a little different. they do they walk a little different so what's in here No, I started using it last year. It's just kind of a winter thing. Oh, okay. I'm going to take. So what do you? What were you feeding them? No, no, like the, the, that's a new crow. That's a Nutra B patty. <coughs> I guess they liked it. They ate it, right? Yeah. When did you start feeding them that? I don't remember. Is it Pretty well out of the barn. So they were indoors, what day did we move out, Jay? I don't remember. Uh, oh, it was about the first of April. Second of April. It was, it was at the third of April there. It, it was in so, some cold weather. Not bad, eh? It's, it's not fantastic, but it's okay. Six, I think it's so. six, seven, eight, whatever. I don't smoke them too much, and they're hard to work with, but 
I'm going to work with my back to you. That's maybe not good. That was a feed frame from last fall that they've had. So they ate that feed and then fill it with pollen. Just so this doesn't throw anybody, I've simply set these up on some empty hives to make them easy to work today. Those bottom boxes are nothing. That's a drone frame. See how the pattern is big? Yeah, they're easy to keep track of when they're they're green. I do that lots, put throw drone frames in. I've been using them each year. They're putting some nectar in that one. No, I haven't started any yet in there, but uh, I I saw Brad do it last year and I threw them in that and man, the burr comb was gone. It was it was unreal. It really does, yeah. Because yeah, they're not building drones up here. Build it on the top, it's all on the frame. All nice and clean. It was it was unreal. They just put all <laughs> so the focus into so the drone. So you put one frame. one in per high. I put one in, yeah. You got to keep remembrance on that date. See if you're you planning on pulling them, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the grossest thing in like the world. You get all the varroa. <laughs> what do you do with them? Well, do you, you freeze them or do you, you just leave them out in the sun? You, you freeze them. I freeze them for a couple of days and then I, I go out and you just scrape them and it's gross as heck. If you leave them to hatch out, you've now. <laughs> that's freaking. Yep. That, that's why it's really important, right? Because yeah. like drone frames. She's shaking. <laughs> I haven't really identified that. There's a bee here. I just saw her do it. No, she's doing that shaking dance. She's do, she oh, grabs she's she grabs a bee and shakes the bee. I think she's. I like, watched a video of Tom Seeley explaining what that is. And no, it's she's wake she's waking up bees. She's saying, "Okay, it's it's day. We got to go out and get the nectar. There's stuff out there. We need more foragers. Wake up." Okay, so you got some. Cap. See, she's doing it too. That's what they're doing, they're waking up other bees. Yeah, they'll grab the bee and they'll shake. Quit being lazy. Wake up! <laughs> yeah, okay. The foragers uh, are the only ones who sleep, according to Seely. She's good there. I didn't see the queen here. Or something like that. that. That can be used also to treat also, but it's not... Doesn't... So we're looking for the queen, but we can also no. kind of look for where we're going to notch. And there's nothing there to, to work with. Yeah, it, I think you can screen boxes on the top as well. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I'll take the strips off for now so that she doesn't hide in there. Yeah. 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 <coughs> Some guys swear Interesting uh, contrast of two colors of bees in here, eh? We've got yellow ones and we've got black ones. What is that from? Is that from the drones? Or well, they're all half-sisters, eh? There's like 15 different fathers here or something like that, so... so yeah, some of mine are just right here. Yeah, yeah. So we'll likely notch somewhere in here so they have some space. <laughs> Traditionally, I, I, I block them up. So this is the perfect stance. The the sun is straight over my shoulder to, to find what you need to find. Not bad. And spraying, eh? Doesn't matter. Is that right? Coming through my notes, looking, you know, I am ignorant. Are they productive? Yes. Yeah. It typically goes together. <laughs> typically goes together, eh? I just still don't like her. Does anybody see the queen? Call her out. I think... I don't recall. I don't think I saw her last time. No. It's, it's like anything else with lots, lots of eggs there? Yeah, we've got lots of opportunities. She's been laying. There's a queen in here. There's something in here laying eggs. I don't know. <laughs> See, they're making a plan here. They come up and look at you and they start getting together and making a plan. I just don't want to make the queen run too much, you know? Too much smoke. Well, 
I don't see her on that one either. Lots of foragers out, eh? There, there's uh, not that many bees in here. Oh, okay. When do you start pulling off the entrance reducers? Whenever I see congestion, you know, it's pretty low tech reason. It's just, uh, So this is a, a frame where she's, the there. there she is, a big black one. Okay, so that's fine. We don't need to pick her up. We don't need to cage her. Do you see her? Yeah, I see right there. Right here. Yeah. Just a little bit bigger abdomen. We don't need to cage her. We don't need to do anything with her. We'll just move her right over there. She's got a frame here that's, uh, she's got a little bit of capped and then every age. There's some nectar on this frame, and uh, so we've got our nuke ready here. I'm going to make sure I carry this with the queen up. I'm going to set her right in the center there for now. Oh, you found her? Yeah. Sweet. So for this, for this instant, I'm going to steal some resources from this hive. This is just an empty frame for her. I'll put that between her and the divider because I want to keep her safe. So just squeeze that in there a little bit. And this is a nice frame because there's lots of feed and there's some pollen there too. I'll put the pollen facing the frame that she's on. There's a dead out here next to her. I'm just going to steal some frames to fill the box. Now, what have I not done for this nuke? Am I ready to put the lid on? You're right, I don't have enough bees in there. That's my funnel. So, I don't want to decimate this hive too much, but I need a few more bees for her. Who knows how you separate field bees and house bees. House bees won't fly away. That's right. Just like that, right? Okay. <laughs> and when the field bees leave this nuke, where are they going to go? Over there. You have to separate them a certain distance, orientate that box differently to help stop that. That depends on that principle. I'm going to leave her right here because I'm going to count on getting enough house bees in there to take care of her. So if there's, those house bees don't know where they are, so they're not going to leave here. And there's brood in there, brood's an anchor. That's right. Normally I would set that nuke on my stand over there. I'll leave it here for now. They're all house bees, they don't know where they are. They'll stay in here. I want a reducer for that, but this is kind of a rough part, but this one's dead anyway. I'll use that lid. Okay.
So that's the hardest part of OTS. Right there. So now we're going to do the notching part. And you may ask how many notches are we going to make? Well, how many queens do you want? How many queens do you want depends on how many queens you want. How many what what are your goals? So at the very very beginning of today I said what our goals were today. Does anybody remember what our goals are? Why are we doing this? Swarm mitigation. Swarm mitiga mitigation. So now we have to kind of break this hive down far enough that it's not going to swarm. Who here thinks this swarm is this this hive is likely to swarm in the next 15 to 20 so. days? No, it's not, is it? No. Well, it can't because the queen's over there. <laughs> That's a good point, a good but as point. far as a strength standpoint, yeah. it's really not that booming, is it? So what we can do is we'll make, we'll, we'll notch one frame and we'll do two notches on each side. <coughs> this is... I think your notches would be depend on how much 36 hour, or 36 hour larva you can find. Okay. We'll get our, our young eyes here. Can you see, what's your name? Uh, James. James? Okay, I'm going to point with the corner of my hive tool. See, I can't see it. Hold it? No. Do you see the egg in here? In this one? You see the larva here, right? That's probably about four days old. There's an egg in here. See the eggs over here? You can tell what eggs look like if you see these. Tiny little grains of Just rice. Just a little grain of rice in there. And you can tell they're about to hatch because they're laying down. Usually they're standing up. But there's a larva here and there's an egg here. And there's a little wet spot of something down in the bottom there. And that's what I want. That's my just hatched egg. It's, it's the youngest larva of all. You can see some down here. See this little one right there? A little tiny larva? That's probably just a little too old. I'm going to notch this and then I can pass it around. You want to make sure your hive tool is nice and clean. I'll pull that away. This comb is fairly new so it's a little sticky, but it's soft and easy to <laughs> do. Okay. So, James, you want to take that frame, hold it just like on the edges, bring this hand over here, and you walk that around and show everybody the notch. Okay. Careful you don't trip on the stuff on the ground there. I'll notch another one while he's gone. <laughs> If you can get a really good picture in there, that would be fantastic. Uh, oh, yeah. It's a it's not a great pattern is the problem. They're kind of they're kind of Hi what? <laughs> it's upside. Yeah. No, it's not. <laughs> Jay. Does anybody want to Get in here at all? Oh, bring her over here. Thanks. Bring her down. Oh. Can, I, can, I, can I take a peek? Here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, look right in there. Just give me enough that I can see. And, uh, can you see? Oh, yeah. Oh, take it away though. My depth perception is <laughs> toast when you do that. So I'm going all the way to the foundation. Make sure you're all the way to that plastic. Give a little pull. Pull it down so they've got room to make that cell. All the pull is stuck to my eye tool. So that's what that is. I'll finish a couple more. Have the little liquid, the telltale liquid. No, just yeah. No, it's good. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> will they? If you expose just eggs, will they put the royal jelly in on the? In Some guys do eggs. Some guys do eggs. So the thing is, I've covered my bases here because this larva is obviously too old. How old would that be? And so is this one. I don't know. 
I don't know if John maybe can tell me, but I, I that's probably about four days after hatch. And and then so over here we probably have one that's just hatched, and then we have eggs over here. So we've kind of covered our bases. Do you have to drag it down the distance of what the uh, they'll, they'll come sideways a little bit, and they'll rework this too. It's nice soft new comb. Yeah, yeah, they'll do the job. Now this one is a little questionable, but I'll make one here. It's not the greatest frame, to be honest. Right there, down like that. Yeah, it's all sticky. <laughs> so I'll do a couple on the other side if there's. Larva, and then we'll pass that around. The amount of pollen in the hive is just amazing. This time of year is incredible, isn't it? <laughs> like frames of it. Yeah. I'm getting so I can't see it. This one. Little grains of rice, not even. And those are the ones that he's gonna. So can pull that, pull that floor away first, and then go back in, right under the larva, and then pull that down. And I'll try and get one, one more in here. I think I'm gonna stay on this side though. And I think I'm gonna do it right here. Do you wanna go just at the bottom of that, of that guy? And the thing is, you can make lots and lots of notches if you're not sure, right? Can you make too many for the size of the population? I don't think so because they're only going to make one or two cells per notch. So are you after like the ones that are right here or, or further? You can just hardly, yeah, it's this one on the top. This is the cell you're working with. Here. You're just taking the bottom half of that. Take that bottom bottom floor out of the cell, yeah. Oh, we must have been doing this already. Head harness? Or the ball adding. You can see the... You can see it out. If you look up close right... Have you made the rounds? Perfect, thank you. Of that liquid that he was talking about, the little jelly. Like on that, on that one, they're right there. So out of this, which one is, are you aiming for? Out of those? Wiggle the thing around for The one up in here. That one? I didn't see any. Some of these, you can hardly see them, eh? So you can see this one. Yeah. And then if it, if the pattern flows, you can, it gets younger. So you've got an egg out here. Yeah. And then, so I'm thinking I'm looking at, at, at chiefly these two cells. Okay. I think that there's some in here. Oh yeah, so just that one queen produced in those spots? Like the, the they can make more than one. Yeah. Like, is that a bit of a problem? No, because you can't, you can't cut them anyway on plastic. And, so we, yeah, you know how hard it is, eh? So we'd be talking like that one? For my fingers? Yeah, let me look at that. Like, is that what we're aiming for? Really, the height is the sudden possible stop at the bottom. Yes. Yeah, I can barely see that larva no, it's down there. Can, it's a, yeah, it's a J, and, and it's, I can barely yeah. see the bugger. So, I have to get my hive tool turned around here. It's this one you're talking about right here, right? You've you've lost it now, but I'll just mark it. So they put the liquid, the royal jelly in. See that one? Uh, right yeah, the day that. So you look how the lights. The day they've had. Yeah. So we found that third day. Yeah. I mean, seven days later. She Check. They built it out and they capped it, and you know you got queen there. Saying. So when do the eggs fall over and then are no longer sitting vertical? Three. Well, they they fall over and hatch. I don't know how long it takes to hatch, but not long. There you go. Yeah. Okay. No. Right. Right. Okay. So there's a whole bunch, oh, there's one even smaller than that one yet. And that's the thing. You can notch them if they don't like it. They'll rebuild the comb. It's surprising how fast they'll just rebuild that if they don't like it. But you'll, you'll, you'll want to move that out of there because when she comes out and she does her meeting point, you want that off in a different spot. You'll try to that set up there. He's actually talking about building a spot out there even further. So what happens to the other direction? Well, you put the queen, you put the queen back in there along with, the, yeah, you put the old queen back into the colony again with all the bees and you just leave her alone to build up again. Yeah, he's working on it. 
So what's uh, how far away do you take the well, ideal, that's, uh, that's got the new, uh, queen cell? Ideally, how far away do you want to be, Brad? You'd like to be a couple miles, wouldn't you? I don't know. I don't, I don't know really the rules. I, I think you're mostly dealing with the fact that you have a very small nuke in your bee yard and you don't want to get robbed or something. Yeah. I think he likes the bee business. Uh, I wasn't planning on bringing mine. My split's very far away. I, just I know a, 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 a commercial breeder. He he takes it a few miles because he's got a he's got a drone yard and he's got a really nice uh, he's got a really nice topo topographical formation that kind of uh, is good for DCAs. So he wants his drone mothers near there. There's some drone cells on the airside. DCA. Drone congregation area. Yeah. The bar. It's where the boys pick up the girls. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, you want to lift up the frame there, Brad? Just showing them. Those are, oh, yeah, yeah. Those are drones. Okay. Oh, yeah. So yeah. you eliminate that by having a frame of uh, with the drone foundation, right? Well, it, 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 was, it was noticeable. Boy, it's, it's clean, if clean if you give them drone. You give them a spot to use that burr comb and for building drone frames, it's noticeably clean. You don't, you, want the you don't get this in the bottom. Here. Yeah, that, well, that's exactly it. I'm trying to. I started inspecting when I was a fairly new beekeeper, and so my hives were, were the norm for me. And when I started looking into other people's hives, I couldn't believe the mess in them. And the difference was I had a drone frame. Their bees were trying to build all their drones on the top here. Top or bottom. And mine weren't. They're building them on the drone frame. But it doesn't have to be fancy like that. Like that's your Bring those two out, Jay. But you're you're committing a, a one frame of a, of your hive to non-productive. Uh, well, they're productive. They'll put they'll fill it with either pollen or nectar or drones or whatever they want. And she won't lay more drones. Uh, See this bee here? Never, never She's figured, figured out there's no queen. The only reason why they use yellow would be that she doesn't know where the queen is. <laughs> so they're going to get kind of worked up. They're going to the not get aggressive, but they'll After they'll start roaring and fanning. And, and I mine all mine were yellow. Well, yeah, playing with brood. With Carol's the having a time with the camera. Oh, it's so easy to see. On one of the pictures that we took of the <laughs> notch, yeah, so there's a cell with two eggs in it. What would be the outcome? Do you think? I've read that the bees will often just remove one of those. Eat it, like you chew it out and yep. spell it? Well, it's a protein source, so they'll yeah. they'll make raw jelly out of it or something. Yeah, um, that's Because, you know, even some young queens can do that, eh? Have you seen that? I've got a hive over there that was doing that, and I'm sure it's not a worker. I've seen it, yeah, with them just late. Yeah, it's, it, and it's it, not a worker. It seems more that it was not enough bees in there. Is that right? From one of those uh, Saskatchewan. I don't think they can. I, I certainly don't like think they can. Lay. I, that's my theory, anyways. And it didn't seem to be because well, it like just solved itself. Yeah, they they can't raise more on, than one. Because I was on the oh my god, I have this worker laying business. Like even with the reading on that, and by the time I figured out all the reading business of what to do, when checked, I'm like, oh, they seem to be fine there. Yeah, <laughs> even a laying worker, she'll she'll have six or eight eggs in there, but there's only one drone ever comes out, so. Yeah. I think they probably deal with that yeah, pretty quickly. Are you happy with those Saskatrans? That's the only winter. Why, right, 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 right. Well, that's what I says a lot. That. I don't know. That says a lot this year, man. <laughs> okay. I'm happy with that. I only had six, and you know, the half of them survived. So I don't know. It's, I thought that was disgusting until everybody else I talked to. No, you're, you're seemed you're to me. Well. So we've got a little more than a nuke here now, don't we? Is it five frames? Well. I've, I've taken some and taken brood. So this is not very strong. I certainly would like a stronger hive for building cells like that. Do we still have a frame out going around? There's yeah. a, this drone on here. Stick this one back in here. That was both sides, so put that in here. I think I'm going to leave the drone out for now. It's kind of pointless with this. Uh, I've got nothing to lay in there anyway, right? <laughs> no queen. So what do I got? I got six. So I need four more. You don't, you don't use the metal rest? 
I have some boxes with them. They're, they're kind of nice. These are fairly new, so I didn't need them. Okay, I'm going to grab these two frames out of this dead out. Like, would they, have, would they have been picking over these, or were they sealed up? They weren't sealed up, but I, I haven't had a lot of robbing like that. Okay. I've got a lot of, uh, a lot of open boxes against, uh, against best practices, and there just hasn't been, the, the, the colonies just haven't been that strong. Or there's been so much to pick and choose. They've got a lot to feed in there, so they're not hungry. I do, there's one. I can, uh. I need one more. Okay. Thank you. Which boxes should I take from here, Brad? Just about anything. Yeah, it doesn't matter. <coughs> How many did you have winter that actually came out? I think we brought 64 live ones out, something like that. So 40% loss. Yeah, I had about just over 40% loss. Yeah, yeah, it uh, absolutely hurt. Now, we need to put this back in because does anybody know why we put this back in? <laughs> Good point. We don't want to put that in front of that uh, notch, do we? <laughs> you need to put that in because these bees are treated. These bees have amitraz on them. And with any me medication, doctor always tells you take all your antibiotics, right? That's because if you stop part way through, you will be breeding resistant bacteria. And we don't want to breed resistant mites. We want to kill them. Should be separated by two slots. So we'll go over here. We have two notches here. So I'll put that you ever use that max? I have not. I'm too chicken to use max. <laughs> what is that? The uh, Mitoacryl. It's a formic oh, acid oh. product. Yeah. Bad. Oh, I've used Mitoacryl strips. Yeah. How did you find that? Well, I got 100% success in the whole <laughs> Yeah, no, I was just the, the formic acid. Good though. product. Oh. Temperature is the killer, I, I'm told. Yeah, you just gotta be on it. Very careful. And one of my hobbyists used it and she really liked it, got a good drop. But the last day that they were in was our 30 degree day. And she was totally freaking out with good reason. Okay, we'll put the lid back on. Thank you. <laughs> we'll uh, put that aside. Yeah, yeah, they don't need covers anymore. So you never <laughs> have upper entrances? Way. You know, I did my first year, and that's it. Uh, all the commercial guys I look at, they don't use it, so. So I haven't. So what do we want to do? Do we want to uh, have, have some hands-on and do some more? Pardon me? Have you seen any drone at all walking around? No. No. <coughs> no. I'm a little early. I, I'm kind of a little nervous about doing it this early. but So I didn't get a response. Anybody want to try? See, so you want to try? Of course. Yeah, Steve so wants to try. Okay. <laughs> like Here's yeah. a couple hives right here. 